Hello and welcome to the Q&A session. I'm Emily Mount, Lead Product Manager for Google Quantum AI and also your moderator. Um, I have a star-studded panel today, um, so let's get started with some introductions. Hartman, could you kick us off, please? Uh, yeah, um, you want us to introduce ourselves? Um, that yeah, would I'm be Hartman, lovely. And I'm the lead of the Quantum AI. Sorry, I just said this already. I think I'm coming in by satellite, so there's a little delay in the line. So I try again. I'm uh, Hartman Neven. I'm the lead of the Quantum AI team. Marissa, could you could you go next? Happy to. My name is Marissa Justina. I am a senior research scientist and quantum electronics engineer working uh, with the primary focus on hardware on the Quantum AI team. Sergio? I'm Sergio, and I lead the quantum computer science group, so theory, software. And Matt? Hi, everyone. I'm Matt Trevithick, and I'm the chief operating officer of Google Quantum AI. Thanks a lot, everyone. Um, Hartmut, this first question is for you. And the question is, what's the first impact most people will feel from quantum computing? Do they have to wait the 10 years of a roadmap for that? Yeah, I think we heard over the last two days many attempts at this answer. I think the, the killer app, the, the gift that uh, keeps on giving, is Richard Feynman's original insight that quantum simulation can only really be done efficiently with um, programmable quantum matter, say a quantum computer. And this application to then the various areas where quantum effects matter will be will lead to improvements that um, consumers or um, people on the street will notice first. Thank you. Um, Sergio, Kishan asked, um, Kishan from India asked us, how can quantum computers help the world address climate change? So, uh, uh, sorry about the interruption. Uh, yeah, so climate change is a is a problem in uh, the uh, production and, and transport and consumption of energy. And energy is, well, it's basically then a problem if, in physics and chemistry. And uh, what, what happens is that modern physics and chemistry is quantum mechanics. And as Harmut was saying, that will be the first application of quantum computers. Uh, so right now there is only a small part of quantum mechanics of modern physics and chemistry. So all the problems related to energy that we can actually simulate or understand is just a, a tiny part. With a quantum computer, we can do quantum simulations and, and we can process you know, a much larger part of modern chemistry and physics. So concrete examples will be uh, superconductors. So right now we lose like around 5% of energy just in the transmission of energy. If we had high temperature superconductors, then you know that number would be 5%, it might be 1% or even 0%, right? This has been studied a lot in the concept of quantum computing. Uh, the, the Haber process is another example that has been studied a lot. We consume, well, actually 1.5% of the CO2 that we put in, in the atmosphere is through the Haber process by for creating fertilizers. So if we improve that process, which we think it can be done because nature has more efficient processes, we might solve just with this process 1% of the CO2 emissions. And other example, actually, Harmut mentioned in his keynote that maybe even Fusion, you know, there are problems in fusion that we would like to understand better, right? And with a quantum computer, we will be able to do simulations are related to fusion that we cannot do today. So yeah, it will help <laughs> for climate change for sure. That's great. Um, Hartman, how can we combat the false expectations of hype while still nurturing the productive excitement around quantum computing? <laughs> I try a little bit, but since you are a new product manager, I will return the um, answer to you then. Um, but I think that the best way is to just be as honest as possible and share the latest insights and information we have. For example, I was drawn into this field because I thought quantum enhanced optimization is a winner. And we have learned over time that this is not so easy and it may not be one of the nearer or even longer term uh, killer applications. So once we gain such an insight, we need to share it and not keep um, customers pointing into this direction. 
but I would be curious what you feel about that. Yeah, Herman, I completely agree with you. I think there's sort of two pieces to this. I'd say transparency is certainly one of them. Um, what we're doing is exciting. So I have no fears about being completely transparent and having people still be excited about it. The other piece is education, which is sort of what we're doing now and why we've had this symposium. So I think those two pieces together are, are really how we usher everyone into the excitement away from any false expectations. Okay, Sergio. Uzair from Canada asked, what research areas for an incoming PhD student do you think could make the biggest impact on the future of quantum computing? Right, so quantum computing is a big field and it's hard to pick up a specific areas. Uh, but uh, I guess if you are starting your PhD, you probably want to work on areas that are not mature now and they will change quite a bit in the next five years because that's where you can have more impact in the PhD. So maybe a couple of examples will be quantum algorithms. We saw actually in the talks today how quantum algorithms are changing a lot and quantum algorithms are very important for quantum computing, right? The more we know about applications of quantum computing, the more enthusiastic we are about building one. We are in other groups, right? Um, we need more applications for sure. So quantum algorithms remains, I think, a, a, an important area. Another area that I think will keep changing a lot during the next five years will be uh, protected superconducting qubits. So uh, we saw yesterday uh, from the Harvard Leeds and other talks that we have a roadmap to build a quantum computer, which is, we think, realistic, but is complex, right? And a lot of this complexity comes from the control required to do the error correction. So we have all these control lines and electronics, and that's going to be expensive. We think it's, it's doable and we have a realistic roadmap, we believe, but it's complex. If we manage to move some of this complexity into the physics design of the qubit, so the qubit is protected somehow, and, and instead of external control, the physics takes care of some of the error correction, that will simplify a lot the design of a quantum computer, will make it a lot cheaper, and I think will accelerate uh, the field substantially. So I think this is another area which is likely going to change. In five years, you can see some progress in the topic in the in the talks in our YouTube channel, the YouTube channel of Quantum AI, and of course in, in other places as well. That is an awesome lead in to actually my next question, which is for Marissa. Um, Marissa, I know you had um, a part of making that 10 year roadmap that we've been talking about over and over again for the last two days. Um, so I'm interested in how you approached that exercise um, and how you determined what the first few milestones should even be. That's a great question. It was not straightforward. Um, the, that road mapping exercise was really a team wide exercise that started in the middle of 2019 and we, we kind of wrapped our first pass on it by mid 2020. So it was a pretty, pretty intense uh, full team exercise. And we started even by trying to figure out what the roadmap should be a roadmap to. Where, where, where are we trying to go? What destination should be included on that map? Um, that in itself was a difficult challenge. And of course, you have to figure that out before you plot milestones along the way. Then the choice of milestones, also critical, um, came out of deciding we want our roadmap to be toward building a fault tolerant universal quantum computer. And the, the idea behind the milestones as well was to pick something based on actual achievements technological achievements, not just number of qubits. It's very easy and very tempting to say, we'll make this many qubits and then we'll double it or we'll 10x it or something. And, and to look only at number of qubits as a metric. It's very easy for, for anyone to, to fall into that metric. That's really not what we want to do. Yes, each uh, milestone we choose, we expect to require more qubits, but also, as Sergio was just saying, it's not clear even what the architecture will necessarily be or, or what uh, performance demand we will put on each of those qubits. And we try to capture that in the milestones as well. So keeping milestones that are uh, specific physics tasks or specific technological developments was really key in plotting out that roadmap. And then the process was uh, just to to bring in the whole team, as much of the team as wanted to participate at however much they wanted to participate, we broke into a number of working groups, each focused on a different section of technology on the team and tried to scope out the lay of the land, identify what are the challenges we see, um, what's going to be difficult and where do we need to focus moving forward. But like any roadmap, um, it deserves a, a regular refresh. So it's a, it's a project that's never complete. 
That makes a lot of sense. Um, as you were doing that, did you find any like spaces or fields that you don't think get enough attention? Did you find any sort of gaps? That's, uh, I, I would say my main take home from or related to that is that we, we rely a lot on engineering disciplines that are, that tend to be underrepresented in quantum computing. So we, we need a lot of support from say microwave engineering or material science in ways that don't normally show up and aren't normally the people that are applying for, for roles on a, on a team or may not even know that we need mechanical engineers and, and you know, various kinds of electrical engineers. So I would say that the place that kind of goes unnoticed or, or under, underappreciated is just the amount and the breadth of engineering support that is needed for this kind of a project um, beyond the sort of stereotypical physicist. I love that you're bringing in the, the outside expertise, which we need to bring inside. I love it. We need um, it. Matt, yeah. Matt, I have a hard question for you. And it is, what does the quantum computing funding landscape look like over the next 10 years? Great question, Emily. So the capital markets work in cycles. There are cycles of expansion and there are cycles of contraction. And I've come to appreciate that that's a really important uh, component, this dynamic system of almost breathing. When you have these periods of expansion, you have investment in a lot of new ideas. And then these periods of contraction kind of force the finite resources, the people and the money towards the stronger projects. And as chaotic as it seems, this is actually the process of, uh, of progress and how things work. So over the next 10 years, I expect us to see maybe more than one cycle of boom and, and bust. Now, the real question for quantum computing is, let's find some valuable applications because then we start to become dependent on customer revenue and not investment dollars. And that's a much, much better place for any industry to be, including this one. So I think we're all on this uh, path of application discovery. Uh, we're very optimistic it's gonna happen, uh, but the question is just, just when and how much, but that's part of what makes this new field so exciting. Yeah, and I think we just heard Ryan talking about some application discovery. So we are working on that, of course. Um, Hartmut, Doug Fink asked, asked a question of you, which is, can you comment on the Chinese Zukonji announcement that they've replicated the Beyond Classical experiment with a few more qubits? Part of this question that Doug asked, he asked, would it be fair to say that Google could have easily done something similar, but that you or we thought it was more important to focus our resources on finding applications for a quantum computer rather than just replicating the experiment that we did two years ago with a few more qubits? Yeah, happy to comment on this. Um, yeah, the um, Chinese um, experiment under John Wei Pan's group uh, that essentially replicated the 2019 um, sampling of uh, random uh, circuits in a way it was nice to see i mean as a scientist that what you hope happens you know that um, you propose some experiments so you go on a certain route and then you hope that others will follow um, verify what you have done possibly uh, find mistakes or improvements this is how um, science worked and yeah it was definitely a, a fast following we saw there by the uh, chinese team um, the second part of the question yeah, and in some ways, you can say we, we moved on. Um, we understand how noisy um, random circuit sampling works. The basic story is that the classical costs um, are exponential in the computational volume. Um, no improvement in algorithms, since there were a lot of improvements, have changed this. They're all exponential. And because the um, computational volume um, also grows every year, you, due to hardware improvements, you get this double exponential um, growth in cost for classical computers to simulate these experiments. And that has not changed. And that was the basic thing we showed in uh, 2019. And now our attention is more on getting error correction to work. You heard a lot of talks on those. And to find the first practically useful applications for the NISC era where we do not yet have uh, error corrected machines. But eventually we should probably just for fun redo it once uh, with a bigger chip, let's say using 72 um, qubits. Cool. Um, Sergio, 
This is sort of taking a turn from the last question, but how will quantum computer programming change as we move from the NISC era to programming a fault tolerant machine? Right, well, before answering that question, I wanted to say because Hermit is not oh, going to say it, but he explained about the quantum volume. That's what we call Nevin's law, <laughs> because actually Hermit came with this idea. Uh, uh, well, studying the complexity of simulating this random circuit sampling, which is, you know, a double exponential growth on the cost of simulating the experiment, which doesn't happen too much in nature. You don't see too many double exponentials. But anyway, so to your question, um, uh, well, on the NISC era, like the experiments you have seen today, uh, the, the first couple of talks, we are limited to, you know, a, a thousand gates now, let's say, or maybe tens of thousand gates looking in the next couple of years. Uh, so uh, when we have a fault on quantum computer, we're going to be able to run circuits with billions of gates, right? Uh, more similar to some of the algorithms that Ryan was explaining. So it's a very different mindset. The experiments in the NISC era with a few thousand gates, they look a bit like physics experiments. And when we have a fault on quantum computer, then you're going to program it like a computer science will program a regular computer. So it's going to be more a computer science uh, kind of programming than, than a physics experiment. So more abstraction layers so that um, it's easier to? For sure, yeah. We, there's going to be a lot of work on the pipeline, you know, to get there and build all these abstraction layers. That's, that's going to change a lot as well. Great. We actually had a question that just came in on the on the online chat that I'd like to slip in here, which is from Michael Huka. Huka? I don't know, Michael can tell me later. Um, and I think actually maybe Matt's the person that I wanna ask this question of, which is AI went through a period of time, sometimes called the AI winter, because overhyped promises failed to materialize and people got disillusioned. Is quantum computing in danger of the same? Well, Jeffrey Hinton is a colleague of ours at Google, so we have a lot of direct experience with this, uh, this situation. So Michael, we appreciate the question. Um, how I'd like to answer it was, is with a more general observation which is that all technologies are adopted in what's called an S-curve. So basically at the very start of any technology adoption, you have a group of enthusiasts and technology visionaries that are working in it. And then it goes through a period of mainstream adoption. And then there's a period where pretty much everyone that wants to use it is using it. And so this S-curve is obviously, uh, you know, it's nonlinear, but humans have evolved biologically to think very linearly. So we tend to think that today will look like yesterday and tomorrow will look like today. And so this creates a systemic situation where we always overestimate the potential of a new technology, and then we always underestimate its potential impact. And so I think it's a challenge for anyone in a new field is to be very truthful, which has been said a couple of times before, about exactly where we are at any moment of time and to not participate in necessarily the, the overhyping of it too early, but also not to underappreciate what it could potentially do. So I think by, by recognizing this general condition, uh, we can avoid some of the worst, um, I, I'd say fluctuations of this overhyping underappreciating cycle. I love that answer. Okay, um, Marissa. When we're thinking about going from the NISC era to the fault tolerant era that Sergio was talking about a second ago, what are the top three tech roadblocks uh, that are in the way of basically scaling to a general purpose quantum computer that's really useful? I might turn that question around and point out that no part of this is gonna be easy. It's uh, it's hard to pick three, I, I would say all of it, uh, but I can, I can try to break it into three sections, if you will, or three ways of thinking about it. And they're all gonna be things that you've been hearing about before. One of them is uh, the architecture, as evidenced by the numerous different architectures being pursued by different groups and even different architecture considerations out there in the literature, architecture discussions that we still have um, among active research. We don't know which architecture is going to first yield a general purpose quantum computer. And that is going to be a source, continuing to be a source of in deep, intense research for quite some time to get there. Um, so the second re deeply related piece is then the error correction aspect itself. And those, those two are paired, of course, what architecture you're using um, couples directly with what error correction scheme you, you use and the physical hardware to implement it. Error correction is 
a crucial piece of building a, a functional quantum computer, a, a useful general purpose quantum computer, we wouldn't be so far along the building process if we didn't have deep confidence in the capabilities of error correction. However, there's significant additional work needed, um, not only in fleshing out our theoretical understanding better, but in building hardware that can support the feed forward operations needed to actually implement that error correction. Um, and then finally, I would say the, the third one is control lines and, and the sort of wiring infrastructure, cryogenic infrastructure or interface infrastructure, depending on what architecture you're working with. Uh, we, we're talking about really staggeringly large numbers of control signals in a lot of the quantum computing architectures that are being proposed. And there are new problems there in just the, this very large amount of IO going to and from a processor that will need to be tackled. So I would, I would kind of break the whole problem into those three sections, but probably pretty much any challenge related to, to building a quantum computer will fall into close to one of those buckets. Emily, I think you're muted. Your mouth is moving, but I don't hear you. You are very right. Harvard, this one's gonna be for you. We talked about how we're looking for applications in the NISC era um, to sort of, you know, provide value before we get to what Marissa was just talking about. Can you tell us what NISC application you wish more people were thinking about? Huh. Yeah, when I saw this uh, question, I, I thought maybe the best way to answer it, and I don't wanna sound uh, cocky, is one of the perks when you w work at Google is that there's really no such thing. You know, if you are worried about something that is not being discussed enough, the second you say it, it is being discussed. So we are not really suffering from this uh, problem that um, there are underexplored areas where we strongly feel, oh, somebody should do something there. We would change it immediately. So that actually rolls right into the next question, which is for Matt, which is what makes Google unique in the quantum landscape? I think Hartman just touched on part of this answer. Yeah, so I'm very respectful of the word unique and how rare it is. So I think Google's advantage has to be, we have to be the most interesting people for talented people to work. We have to be the most interesting place for talented people to work. Um, and that's really the only sustainable advantage. Talented people always have plenty of options about where they choose to spend their time. And what I think Google Quantum AI, you know, has put a lot of effort into doing is to bring resources, uh, some really tremendous colleagues together and a real commitment to this mission of building a useful quantum computer. So we have a lot of good things going here, but we do not take this situation for granted. There is clearly a lot more work to do. And I think very, very humbly, you know, we encourage ourselves and others in this community uh, to work collaboratively to get to a place where quantum computing is really valuable and it's a much, uh, it's a vibrant industry. Yeah, when thinking about how Google is kind of different than some of the other approaches, Marissa, I think a question that comes up really often is why is Google betting on superconducting qubits as opposed to other physical qubits? Could you give us an answer to that one? Sure. Uh... When, we, when you put it like that, it sounds very this or that. And, and in some ways it is because we, we focused our research efforts right now on superconducting qubits. Um, I think there are, there are a myriad of reasons why we're here in the first place, why we're working on superconducting qubits in the first place. Um, but I don't think that we, are, we see ourselves as being stuck here at all. So I, I think the, the way, part of the way we got here in the first place was a historical development. The, Google effort in quantum computing started with Hartmut in the LA office and was actually working with D-Wave, which was a superconducting machine, but using quantum annealer instead of a gate-based model that we are using right now. And they worked with that for a few years and then pivoted a little bit to bringing in a research group, which at that point was the UC Santa Barbara research group uh, led by John Martinez, which was pursuing also building an annealer, but also was pursuing a gate-based model in parallel. So there has always been kind of a fork among different technologies that we may be interested in. And as time has gone on, that technology focus came more on the gate-based model, and, and that's what we're pursuing right now. Um, that said, 
the the team is certainly aims and I, and I think is doing an increasingly good job at bringing in people with a variety of different backgrounds. I mean, Emily, you're an ion trapper, right? And, and my background is in photonics. So we, we bring in different people with, with different backgrounds also because it's really important to keep an eye on those different technologies. And um, so why we got to superconducting qubits in the first place, I mean, I, I think part of the appeal of that, the research group out of UCSB to Google at that time was, it was an academic research group that had a very strong focus on engineering. It was, it was focused really on building the quantum computer, not just just doing uh, quantum parlor tricks as, as we sometimes call them. And, and there's a lot of fun quantum parlor tricks to do. I'm, I'm a quantum foundations person in my, in my, my past, uh, but the engineering is a critical, critical piece of building the machine. And so that was really a focus of the group. And I, I think the group was as attractive for its engineering focus as for the specific technology that was being used. So. Maybe that gives a little bit more color around this this question. It's a very black and white kind of question, but living in it, it, it feels much more multifaceted. And I believe that if we were to determine tomorrow that superconducting qubits are on a particularly shaky footing, but some other technology is much more appealing, we would we would pivot. That's the goal is to build a quantum computer. Yep, that's great. Um, Matt. Another question that we get all the time is how fast is the quantum AI team growing? So we believe that growing at about 50% a year is the right balance between the amount of time we can invest in recruiting and training new people while still working to build a quantum computer and the field is producing really well-qualified talent. So about 50% a year is about uh, the, the, the stable growth rate. Um, we're a team now of about 100 people so that's still pretty small compared to the scope of work that has to be done. And we're gonna hire another 150 people over the next few years. And so I'd like to echo the invitation that Hartman gave in his opening keynote, which is if you can see yourself being part of our team, you know, by all means, you know, go do something great that qualifies yourself to do it and then let us know. So we are a growing team and uh, we look forward uh, you know, to being bigger and better than we are today. That's awesome. Uh, and I can't wait to be part of that. Um, Hartman, I would love your answer to this, which is what is the single, so you only get to pick one, uh, best piece of advice you can give someone who wants to follow in your footsteps? Huh. Yeah, this is what advice is always being given. Find something you're really excited about. Only then you can excel in your area. I'm interested, Sergio, do you have, I, I, haven't, I haven't ever had this discussion with you actually. What is your answer for this? What's your single piece of advice? Uh, I, I think I will echo that actually. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, it depends on where you're working, but in quantum computing and, you know, it's very research uh, frontier uh, area. And we, you know, we work hard. I mean, we, we, we like to have fun. We like what we do, but I think it's very important that as we work harder than what we're doing, that you're really enjoying it, right? I mean, it's really, you know, a large part of your day. So I, I agree with Harman, you know, find something that you're passionate about, that you, you know, you have a vocation to do and everything else becomes easier uh, because, you know, you have to work a lot as well. <laughs> so you, you better enjoy it. Yep, uh, and that echoes definitely what Marissa was saying, which is, and Matt, which is if you can, if you're very passionate about our goal, then, then you should probably come talk to us, right? Um, that's it for our panel. Uh, thank you so much to the panelists. You were great. Um, next up, we're going to have Rafiq with some really an inspiring presentation of artwork. Um, so thanks a lot. <laughs>